And now I'd like to turn it over to Shirley King, Technical Expert Lead with JBS International to kick off the webinar. Thank you, Beth. Uh, my name is Shirley Kane, and I'm from the Red Lake Nation in Minnesota. And I've been at JBS International for a little over two years and been part of the OVC um, initiative and, and so happy and proud to be part of this initiative. Uh, today's webinar features grantees from the Office of Victims of Crime, enhancing community responses to Americans' opioid addiction crisis, serving our youngest crime victims funding initiative. This initiative is designed to raise the nation's awareness of and respond specifically to the needs of children who've been victims of child abuse, neglect, and crimes related to substance use, substance use disorders, and the current addiction crisis. Although this initiative does not specifically fund primary prevention activities, it does support a variety of healing, resiliency building supports, and advocacy services for children and youth who have experienced abuse and neglect. Through these efforts, grantees are healing survivors and strengthening communities now, while also helping to break the intergenerational cycle of child abuse and neglect that stems from addiction, ensuring a brighter future for young people and families for the next seven generations. So we always start off our um, tribal initiatives, our tribal projects, our tribal meetings in a really good way. And so in following with uh, our standards that we've set here, um, I'd like to ask Gloria D from the Diné Nation to uh, start us off with a blessing. Gloria, if you would. Thank you, Shirley. I'm honored. Um, Amen. Thank you. Oh, thank you, Miigwech. That's a really awesome blessing, and uh, I love hearing your language. So, thank you. Um, <laughs> yes. So I will start my presentation. I'm the first one up. Um, next slide. So I call this Wellness for Indigenous Children in honor of Native children past, present, and future. And the reason why I label this is because um, more recently within the past year, uh, they started out and they found uh, a number of our babies that were buried at a place in um, Canada. And then since that time, we've found many, many more in the United States. So that's why I'm honoring the children who were not found and who have been found and who have been returned to their people and, and their people are able to uh, grave them and to um, bury them in a, in a good way and to, um, to help their spirits. And then also our children that are present and those are the ones that our grantees are, are uh, so proudly helping and representing them and uh, helping them to start that process of healing. And then our future generations so if we work with our children today and work with the families, we can stop the trauma from going forward to future generations. Next slide, please. So this is to help promote child abuse and prevention. And this whole month has been dedicated to raise awareness about our children, our native children who've been abused and neglected and to ask the community and people to work together to help prevent this child maltreatment. Uh, neglect, physical, sexual, and emotional abuse are common types. Uh, and I know from my own previous child welfare experience that neglect is one of the highest ones um, that children are removed for. So, uh, and there's various forms of neglect that stem from when uh, 
parents or caregivers are involved in substance use. And it's not a deliberate thing by any means, but it's it happens in our communities. And we have these awesome programs that we'll soon be talking about some other programming, programming they've provided. Next slide. So some of the things that uh, suggestions I'm making for communities is to provide safe, stable, and nurturing relationships and environments to help reduce the rates of ACEs and also child abuse and neglect, and then to help improve the physical, cognitive, and emotional, and I would add spiritual outcomes throughout a baby's life, and then to re reduce health inequities and to have a cumulative positive impact on their health. So it's by starting with this and starting our programs and, and uh, working together in teams to reduce some of these negative effects. Next slide, please. So the goals that I see is to raise awareness and commit to promoting these safe, stable and nurturing relationships and to prevent the child maltreatment that's occurring and to work together as communities. And, and sometimes what you'll hear is they have some awesome multidisciplinary teams that are working together to provide safe, stable, nurturing relationships and environments to protect children from possible maltreatment and to raise awareness by the community to support the vision and to partner with each other and keep collaborating to unite beyond those visions and to make it uh, a mission and then to have goals and objectives like I'm putting here, like I'm stating. Next slide, please. So uh, data, I think data is so important because data can be utilized to inform actions and to look at it uh, and to see how we can you know, synthesize it and then look at it, take stock of it, uh, look at, identify, and fill the critical data gaps, and then use the data to support other action steps. Um, if we're seeing a high rate of out-of-home placement uh, and it's being caused by substance use, what can we do with the data that we have to inform us? How can we design intervention and action plans to help keep our baby safe? So that's what I'm, I'm proposing is in this goal, look at your data. And if you don't have it, start gathering it. We had an awesome data um, webinar yesterday. Next slide, please. Goal three, to create the context for healthy children and families through norms, change, and programs. So to promote the community norm that we all share responsibility for the well-being of our children. And I really like that phrase, it takes a village to raise a child. That means we work together at, you know, in our villages and in our communities to promote that uh, well-being of our babies and to promote the, those positive community norms about parenting programs and acceptable parenting behaviors. What happened in a lot of our communities, and it happened within my own family, when my parents were put into boarding schools, they weren't given those same parenting techniques that their parents and their grandparents utilized traditionally. So if my parents didn't know it, how could they use the techniques and the traditions that their forebears had? They didn't have the same kind of tools that um, their grandparents and their parents had. And then also what's acceptable, what's not acceptable? And how can we do this as a community? How can we say this is what's acceptable as parenting, good parenting, and then implement those evidence-based programs for parents and caregivers, and not just evidence-based, but culturally based. What's in our communities that's cultural? You know, where aunties were seen as disciplinarians, uncles were seen as disciplinarians. That's how a lot of tribes, you know, um, help to parent the children. Or the grandparents, you know, they didn't babysit, they didn't take care of them, but they were, they were always present in their lives. And how can we bring those back? How can we incorporate those into our programming? Next slide, please. So goal four, to always try to keep our babies safe, uh, identify and assess which policies 
that may positive, positively impact our children's lives and our families and our communities. So what do we talk about when we talk about policies? Policies, you know, from a native perspective, they were always there. They just weren't written down. So when we have a policy about what's acceptable in our community, what's acceptable behavior, was domestic violence a part of our traditions? And I would say absolutely not. So some of those policies that we had traditionally, what did we do when people were violent toward each other? What did we do when people hurt each other? We, we had our own ways of dealing with um, violence and dealing with misdeeds in the community. We had our own ways of restorative justice. We had our own ways of peacemaking. We had our own ways of conflict resolution. So we can still identify and assess those policies that have worked in the past and incorporate those into our um, programs. And then provide the leaders with the information on the benefits of not just evidence-based strategies and rigorous evals, but culturally-based strategies. And then work together to do that indigenous evaluation and have evaluations from the community's perspective and also including the tribal folks and the community folks in those evaluation processes. Next slide, please. So here's another way that I see of helping our communities to not only parent, but teach our people some of our old ways, some of our traditional ways. And uh, I got this thank you very much to the to our Canadian relatives, um, the Turtle Lodge and uh, since deceased uh, Dr. David Crescian offered a lot of this um, uh, teachings here that I'm gonna be talking about. So, um, and, and I'm, I'm providing direct quotes from some of the, some of the language he has and, and it's another, there's another agency too that I, I quoted from. We are living in a time that we need a vision of hope based on values and teachings that can set the foundation for a change of heart. The seven sacred laws are the foundation that we are to live by. These laws emanate from having the spirit of kindness. It is the spirit of these seven animals that we call upon to teach and remind us of the seven sacred laws. Love, the eagle is able to reach the highest points of all creatures. This teaching recognizes that true love is connected to the creator. Love that is given to the creator is expressed through love of self because without the love of self, it is impossible to love others. Love is about loving the great spirit, loving the land, loving ourselves in the way we were created and loving each other in the highest way as the ego brings vision that is always based on love. The essence of love is understanding with empathy and compassion. Through the unconditional love of the great spirit, we've all been given the ability to have vision and to make our visions come true. Respect. The buffalo is highly respected by First Nations because it gives its life to and shares every part of its being with the people. It's a reciprocal relationship of respect. It provides the gifts of shelter, clothing, and utensils. Native peoples developed a sustainable relationship with the buffalo, resulting in a relationship that was rooted in utmost respect. Respect is to be a giving and sharing people, first and foremost, following the example of the buffalo who gave its whole being for the life of the people. Courage. The bear is both gentle and ferocious and teaches us the importance of having the mental and moral strength to overcome fears that may prevent us from living our true spirit as human beings. Courage is living from the heart and having the courage to be ourselves. It takes courage to do the right thing for the sake of the children, the way a mother bear would die before seeing harm come to her cub. Honesty. Long ago, there was a giant called Sabe who walked among the people to remind them of the importance of being honest to both the laws of the creator and to one another. Honesty is when we are able to keep the promises made to the creator, self, and others. 
Honesty is being honest with ourselves, speaking and living our truth from the heart. Honesty is refusing to lie or engage in gossip about others. Honesty is being true to our words. Honesty is never judging or condemning others, but to speak well of others, honoring their uniqueness within the human family. Wisdom. The beaver uses its gift as a way to survive. If the beaver didn't use his teeth to build his home, they would grow until they were no longer useful to him. The beaver teaches us that communities are built upon the gifts of each of its members. These gifts, which are given by the creator, are important and necessary to use when creating communities of health and peace. Wisdom is about using the gift the Great Spirit gave each of us to serve and to build a strong family, community, and nation. Our gifts do not belong to us as individuals, but belong to all the people to serve the good of the nation. Similarly, if we do not use our gifts in a good way for the benefit of the earth and the brothers and sisters of our nations, we too would die spiritually. Humility, to recognize and acknowledge the higher power of the creator is considered to be truly humble. By expressing deference and or submission to the creator, we recognize and accept that all beings are equal. This captures the essence of the spirit of humility. The consideration of others before ourselves is also an expression of humility. The wolf teaches us all these lessons. He bows his head and out of deference in the presence of others and will not take food until it can be shared with the other members of his pack. The wolf lacks arrogance and has respect for his community, which is the Aboriginal or indigenous way. Humility is about showing gratitude for life received, never overstepping the natural laws of Mother Earth. Humility is to know that not one of us is ever above or below our fellow human being. We are all equal in the eyes of the Great Spirit. There is so much we can learn from the wolf. The teachings of humility is especially important for the leaders of our nations. Truth. To know the truth is to know and understand and be faithful to all of the original laws as given by the creator. Grandmother Turtle was present when the creator made man and gave him the seven sacred laws. It was Grandmother Turtle who ensured that laws would not be forgotten or lost. The teaching of truth is represented by the turtle. Our motherland is referred to as Turtle Island. To know and live truth is to walk and live all the seven sacred laws. Living truth means living in the spirit of respect, love, courage, honesty, wisdom, humility, and truth. It is when we live truth that we will know peace and find the truth of our humanity. Our spiritual constitution is written on the turtle. The turtle lives in the water and on the land to remind the whole world of the truth we should be living by. The animals that represent the seven sacred laws ensure that we have a close relationship with the land, an alliance with nature. The animal world are our brothers. They live with each other in harmony and bring us teachings. When one is able to walk the spirit of these seven sacred laws is when one becomes truly free. It was then that one receives the full support of the universe and the forces of the earth itself. Okay, that's the seven sacred teachings and me good for this opportunity to share those with you. And so our next um, presenter is Gretchen Morris from the Red Cliff Nation. Gretchen. Bonjour. Gisha Gokwain Indigenous Cause, Wabijeshi Nindo Dem Maskwabi Kang Nindunjba. My name is Gretchen Morris. I'm from the Red Cliff Band of Lake Superior Ojibwe, also known as a Chippewa or Anishinaabe. Um, I'm currently the director of the Indian Child Welfare Department, but really it's more than that to me. I'm here because I want to be 
a support to our children and families. And I want to try to understand the difficulties that they go through um, so that we can better help them and support them in our community. Um, in my experience, I found that there's many, many ways to do that. And today we're talking about prevention work, right? Um, and prevention begins in the community and changing norms, but it also begins when you begin working with the uh, individual and doing that interventive work. I feel that that, that begins then too. So it can go in two, two, uh, two ways. And forgive me today for if I'm, I'm really having a hard time today because today um, we've lost a, a member of our community. And, and even so I felt that very important that I be here to share with you what we do within our community and to offer my thoughts and ideas um, to provide um, change and opportunity to those who struggle more than others. Um, next slide, please. You know, how can our First Nations child welfare program serve as a partner of change with a shared sense of vision? I think about that a lot. And partnering, partnering with who? Partnering with the child, partnering with the parent, partnering with the family, partnering with the community, partnering with our coworkers, partnering with each other. Everyone belongs in the circle. Next slide, please. Creating a, okay, so creating a culture of equity and inclusion, of learning and well-becoming, of inquiry and responsibility, and of caring and collaboration. Again, this includes everyone. And so there's a lot of work to be done because it, <laughs> it involves everyone. Next slide, please. You know, um, I see I have some misspelling up here, but um, you know, it's all gonna be through strengthening relationships to develop a shared sense of purpose. So what I mean by that is uh, shared sense of purpose. What's the purpose here? The purpose is to create a community of wellness that supports the well-being of our tribal children, of our non-tribal children, of our communities, of our extended communities, of our families, of our relationships that we have with uh, coworkers, with um, tribal leadership, with um, multiple, multiple entities. Um, we really need to work on that. And I've been trying to do that myself. I find myself sometimes when I'm in ICWA hearings, I find myself, sometimes I become angry because I think that they should know what they need to do and how to provide active efforts. But I realized that my anger was getting me nowhere. I needed to build a relationship. And I, as I began to change my mindset, it became na more natural for me. And I found that I was able to actually have meaningful conversations with um, those agencies. Again, strengthening relationships with our children spending time with them, understanding what they're going through, understanding their struggles, being out in the community, being involved in community activities that aren't associated with our department um, and, and getting to know our, our people. But also, you know, prevention work can begin by talking to those parents who struggle the most. You know what? I have found, I, I mean, they have given me so much. And I'm so grateful for their teachings. They are beautiful parents who have had so much struggle because our culture and traditions have been taken away from us and our community is fragmented and they are covered with mental 
illness and drug addiction. Again, they are a human being and we love them very much and taking that extra time and that extra energy to understand what they're going through is key in prevention and intervention because they will be our helpers. They, they are the ones that need to help us. So we need to ensure that they're part of our wellness team. They have so much to offer. Um, next slide. You know, community efforts, you know, communities are, uh, they're afraid. They say to me, I don't understand. I, I would never do that. Never have that role. I would never take on that position. And, you know, I used to be afraid to say that I was an Indian Child Welfare Director, but now I'm so very proud that I am in this role because I have opportunity to make change. And also I have opportunity to make connections with my community to help make that change. It's been a struggle because I, I'm, it, it's hard it, when you work in your own community and it's very small. Um, but then I realized that I was just in my own head. I needed to step out. And like today, Shirley Kane got me to step out and speak before you all because I have a responsibility. I, I realized I have a responsibility and I need to be okay with being the director of the Red Cliff Band Indian Child Welfare Department. I am proud to say that I have this role because I know that with the help of my coworkers, with the children and families we work with, with leadership, with other programs, but now, I, I don't, and I hate the word programs, but the people who, who give their hearts in those programs. So the people, the people, we have opportunity to make great change. And it's just an amazing, amazing thing that we could do if we had the right resources to make that change. So promoting healing through culture, right? I've been working very hard. Um, to get that um, option available for our people here. Um, Shirley mentioned that um, OBC has been um, supporting that work and um, we have been able to have some um, many cultural components within our program, but I've also worked with some other funders and am getting support that way as well because we're finding that it is effective. Um, let's connect our children to enhance their well-being, right? Let's enhance parental capacity. But I want you to remember, those parents all have a gift. I've learned so much about parenting when I just listen to some of the skills they have. And also, you know, recognizing strengths is, is key. But then, you know, but then we still have things we need to work on. So there's barriers and yeah. We're gonna, we're gonna have a lot of challenges, but I, I, I feel that um, the way that we create relationship with uh, families can help with that process, partnering, partnering with everyone and anyone that's involved, um, educating. Um, we're going to be bringing a training here on historical and generational trauma. And I have found that um, all of the trainings are geared towards staff. Why not our parents? Why not our community? And so, so I want to bring them in too. So, so they have opportunity as well to understand our history and providing outreach. Um, we have independent living services here and uh, our, our Kellyanne Kapler, Kapler oversees that program. And um, she does so much work with our youth who are aging out of foster care from ages 14 to 23. Also, um, we have case assistant, that's Scott Babb, who goes out in the community and does just about everything that's asked of them. The ladies, uh, Caitlin and Linda are always out in the community and getting to know people and um, 
doing that outreach work. We have preservation and supportive services program in our department and people are now becoming aware of it. And they're like, I didn't know that you guys could provide services without us being involved in your pro without us being in court court involved in your program i'm sorry i'm coming up with the wrong language there but they thought it, it had to be through a court order and um so we're breaking down those barriers as we do word of mouth it seems like when you do the one-to-one -one contact it allows you opportunity to help them understand that we're here for them and and that we want to support them next slide Again, partnerships, and I've explained those to you. Um, there's multiple agencies presented here, but there's many, many more than this that we have partnerships with. Next slide. Um, we've provided traditional wellness opportunities to create relational partnerships. Um, we provide individual, couples, family, one-to-one -one consultation. Um, we also work in the community and do one time per month um, community gatherings. Now this has slowed down since COVID-19 and we also had turnover and consultants. So the positions were, were reposted. We are posting for a male and a female to give that balance. Next slide. Um, we do a lot of community work here. You can see that we, we did a workshop because we need, we wanted more time than one or two days to create skirts and to just hang out, get to know one and one another. Um, uh, and to talk about why we wear these items. Um, and then after this next slide, after we created the skirts, we did full moon ceremony and this was offered one time per month and this is also slowed down but we'll be picking this back up and this is you know a gathering where we the women meet um the young ladies meet and you know we celebrate this time we pray we reflect we understand we let go of what has occurred over the last last month and um make uh and step into the new, always moving forward. Um, so it's opportunity to heal. Next slide. Um, Scotty Babineau um, decided that he wanted to take our youth out. And so he uh, went on a five day journey of self discovery for our males. And um, it went very, very well. And so he went to an island and you can see that he did several cultural activities there and the youth are all asking already, is Scotty doing it again? I'm like, yes, yes. <laughs> Next slide. Um, gathering uh, maple syrup. Um, again, Scotty um, just got done with uh, doing the sugar bush this year and um, he had several uh, young children here helping him and, and uh, parents. So that went very, very well. Next slide. Got to have a little fun, right? So I had to throw in this slide. <laughs> um, trunk or treat with the kiddos. Um, and we want to do more fun, just fun activities with the kids. Next slide. So it's about getting on at their level, right? Figuring out how we can create space to have them there and create opportunity to show them that, you know, just getting together and having a healthy or a nice social activity is kind of what we do and making it a natural thing, right? Um, and then one thing I wanted to offer was something for our physical well-being because mind-body connection is so important. I could not find a funder that would support this. So we took it out of our third party funds. Um, this went very, very well. We had at least eight to 10 people um, at every session. Um, Alyssa Murphy is no longer in the community, so we no longer offer this, but it was, it was a wonderful opportunity for community. Next slide. The winter gathering, we did uh, legendary teachings. Um, we do this annually and it's another effort to create that community connectedness and uh, allow people to 
allow opportunity for us to share um, the work we do and the resources and services that we have to offer in the community. Next slide. Um, I'm not sure if I have enough time to share the video, but there's the link there and there, there's a video. Shirley, what do you think? Do I have enough time? Uh, no. Okay, so there's a link there if you guys would like to look at the video, but it was an amazing gathering with our community. Um, again, culturally uh, focused. We had uh, uh, probably 200 in attendance. Um, so it, it was a beautiful gathering. Um, next slide. Um, we did uh, storytelling. We offered it throughout the uh, winter season. Um, and this, this is just one storytelling um, opportunity, but we also went into the schools um, and we did it, like I said, at least five times. And when we went into the special education classrooms, the children loved it, the adults loved it, the parents loved it, the elders loved it. They want Mr. Donald Appleby to come back. <laughs> Next slide. And it's all about humor too, you know? having humor in the work that we do and creating opportunity to laugh, creating relationships here again to enhance school age children's knowledge of legends. Donald Appleby is the one who um, actually um, designed all these portraits that you see here. And he was telling the stories by using these. Um, and this was to high school students. And we also taught Ojibwe Moen at that time. Next slide. Let's heal our roots together. Um, so another community activity, we were trying to get more and more people involved and let the community know about the work we do and that we needed their support to be part of a child wellness community. I really had a hard time with names like child abuse. I just hated it. So we were trying to come up with different ways to express what was happening to our people because this isn't who we are. This is not who we are. We don't, our people have so much to offer, but they're, the, the, the trauma that has happened to our families and their lack of um, parenting um, being passed down, I guess, Shirley mentioned that too, has really disrupted um, the transmission of um, um, warm, nurturing parenting. So we did a community request for slogans for prevention work and, the, and there was science created. We asked children to create a drawing of, of a family. Youth in care who aged out of care shared their story. Um, we did a child abuse prevention walk. There was 172 participants um, and we had many, many partners involved in this. Next slide. Um, this is just some pictures um, of the walk. We did it um, in our community in Reckliff, but we also went up to the Bayfield School and shared it with the, uh, some knowledge with um, the youth. And again, you can see that they participated and walked as well. Next slide. You know, we can raise resilient children together. That's what it's all about. Next slide. So the signs that I said were placed throughout the community, there were six groups. So we had these made and they were put in our community on the road and the community were, they were writing on Facebook how they liked the signs that they thought, they didn't know that our department did them, um, but they really, really enjoyed seeing them. And they are reclaim traditional par parenting practices, decolonize our parenting. There are no perfect parents. Let's try to be good enough. Let's raise resilient children. The opposite of addiction is connection. When we heal ourselves, we heal our ancestors. Tomorrow isn't promised and here we are today. Be present with your children. Teach patience, kindness, respect because violence is not our way. Um, let's practice our seven teachings with our children. Let's show them the way. And then let's heal our roots together. Next slide. And then um, we wanted to engage the, the, um, the youth. 
And um, I discussed earlier that we have the independent living program in, in our department now. And uh, the youth um, shared this, what they felt was safe and unsafe. And that's powerful. And so um, that that is going to be mounted and put in our community so people can understand better on what children in out-of-home care identify with. Next slide, please. You know, teaching song and dance. Um, so I teach I teach song and dance to area youth, um, dance mostly, um, hoop dance. Um, and that's been slowed down since uh, COVID, but we're gonna be up and running in a couple of weeks. But what I've been finding in some of my research is that um, doing just natural activities, art, sports, dance, is it is wonderful for our children who who have tr struggles and are facing you know traumatic situations this is opportunity to provide them um strength based um uh, i don't know i'm losing my words here next slide <laughs> Next slide. And then again, just some more showcasing um, the ages of the kids. Um, you know, I, I share with you that uh, I recently put out a post to the community that uh, we're going to be um, getting the troop up and running again. And what was interesting is that I had three, three families reach out and said, saying, can I join with my child? So there it is, people. Yeah healing together. Next slide. Chimi Gwedge for listening to, to me today and I hope you enjoyed it. Um, oh. Oh, Miigwech Gretchen. Okay, our next presenter is from the Modoc Nation. Uh, Jason, take it away. Thanks, Shirley. My name is Jason Brandon. I am currently the grant manager for the Modoc Nation's Healing House. Um, so today we're just going to take a little bit of time and kind of overview our program and uh, share some tips to sustainability. Next slide, please. So a little bit about the MODOC Nation. Uh, our program is located here in Miami, Oklahoma. We're in the uh, northeastern corner of Oklahoma. Um, we're in what's called the four state area. So we're a few minutes away from Kansas, about 15 from Missouri, and about 25, 30 from Arkansas. So we have a pretty wide reach um, to the communities around us. The Modoc Nation was relocated to Oklahoma from the Pacific Northwest and is currently the smallest enrolled uh, federally recognized tribe in Oklahoma. They have about 550 members currently. So the Healing House is an outpatient mental and behavioral health clinic. And we started back in 2019 with two staff and grant funding, and we have since grown to 22 staff. And uh, it's, it's been very interesting, to say the least. Next slide, please. So to describe our program, we really want to look at a few different things. We look at our goals, our activities, and our successes. So our main goal from the inception of our program has been to improve the mental health and overall well-being for youth that have been affected by the opioid epidemic. Um, being located in a rural county in Oklahoma, we've seen the pervasive, pervasiveness of the opioid epidemic in our community um, and the intergenerational trauma that comes along with that. So having that goal to kind of shape our activities has been key. Um, so we provide counseling and family services to our community, but a big part of that would be to assess and address the needs of those that we're serving and understand that those needs may change along the way. Um, and in doing that, it gives us the opportunity to kind of come together with other agencies, other partners in our area to create a multidisciplinary response that is community driven. That way it's not just one agency, one program providing all the resources in the area, but we're coming together as a community to reach our community. So for our direct services, we provide intake and assessment uh, we do all forms of counseling, um, case management, life skills coaching, and uh, the crown jewel of our program is our equine assisted therapy. Um, and we're actually in the process of really building that up. We've recently acquired a 60 acre ranch and we're going to be renovating the farmhouse there to 
really bring our two programs together. So some successes that we've had have been forging really strong connections with uh, community stakeholders. That includes, you know, our Boys and Girls Club in Ottawa County, some local schools that we've been uh, fortunate enough to have embedded staff in, and other providers to build that community-driven response. So as we develop a programmatic response, we're, we're not only identifying those needs, but we're meeting the needs for those that are affected by the opioid epidemic. This has ultimately led to us having that program sustainability. Um, next slide, please. So to speak on our spiritual and cultural practices, like I said earlier, equine assisted psychotherapy um, through our Horses of Hope Ranch is key. Um, working with the horses offers opportunities for not only the client, but their families, our staff, to ground themselves in spiritual healing and restore their culture. Um, being in a pen with a horse builds confidence. Um, it also can make you pretty scared if you don't know what you're doing. So it teaches you to have um, those, those skills needed to pick up on other energy levels, other nervous systems in the room and truly identify what the connection is there. It builds self-esteem and identity as well. These opportunities allow for learning and personal growth for our kids. Um, and ultimately we want them to be able to improve their relationship skills and increase their empathetic responses. Uh, next slide, please. So fostering relationships has been a, a really big success for our program and it's one of the main attributes for our sustainability. Um, there's a huge need in our community and we know we cannot handle it on our own. So we need to come together as a community to meet the needs of those in it. So some of our crucial partnerships have been the Boys and Girls Club. Um, like I said earlier, we're currently embedded and partnered with two schools in our district, Miami Public and Wyandotte. Our local Indian Health Services site, NTHS, has been a key component and partnership for us as they have provided counseling vouchers and uh, referrals to our program. And then we've also partnered with the Modoc Nation's Lost River Treatment Center to kind of have a, a, whole ham, a whole family approach uh, to meeting the needs of that trauma in the family. You know, we can provide therapy to our, our kids, we can provide therapy to the parents, but if we're not working together, we're gonna to still see some disconnect. So to forge these partnerships, we've had to have a shared passion. Um, and it's not just having that passion, but be willing to follow up and, and meet face to face to really tackle the hard issues that are in our community. So obviously there have been some challenges with that. Um, COVID-19, everyone's favorite thing, right? But being able to navigate that and still establish that positive relationship in our area has been key. Um, and how do we do that? Well, we have to be consistent. We have to attend you know, multidisciplinary team meetings. We have to be willing to share resources with those uh, also providing services in our area. And we also wanna be able to provide training and support to those other agencies. Because again, this is a big need and we can't do it on our own. So the results of that have been just crazy collaboration between our agencies and our community um, and really having the opportunity to form that community-based approach to meeting our community's needs. Next slide, please. So a key component for us to stay on the path that we're on is being trauma-informed. Um, to do that, we have made a point to engage in trauma-informed care training. Um, so everyone, this is our staff here um, in the picture, everyone, whether they've worked in special education classrooms, community mental health, residential treatment settings, we've all had exposure to secondary trauma. And understanding how that can impact staff has been key for us to reduce burnout and to really prioritize what our staff needs to be able to continue to provide healing in our communities. Um, so being able to prioritize those needs and have those strategies in place has been key in making sure that our staff is at the best possible point so they can go out and help those that need the help the most in our community. Uh, another little caveat there is our tribe has offered a very gracious uh, medical insurance benefits package that covers our own therapy if needed. Um, we also consult with um, outside agencies 
to maintain um, a proper awareness of what trauma is. Um, so we check on applications of theories, practices that have been discussed from trainings, as well as situations that just come up from our day-to-day -day work to make sure that we're able to fully process through the trauma and use that as a lens for our entire program. Uh, another key piece is having supervision and team meetings. So we come together, all of us, uh, every two weeks to review cases, talk about resources in our area, uh, and just check in with each other. So we understand that healing takes place with good healers, and if the healers aren't feeling great, the healing's not going to be great. So we really utilize this time during these team meetings to really build each other up, you know, to share burdens, um, just to be there for each other. And that's shown in our direct services. Um, and then another key piece to our uh, workplace environment has been staff vision and retreat days. So we host a quarterly retreat day for training and team building. And we also host an annual staff vision retreat day for our team to come to the table together to review previous year long goals and short term goals that we may share. Um, using that, we then come up with goals for the year to come. This has been great for our team to feel valued and to really give buy in to everyone on the team. Um, this has also helped us when we go to look for other funding availabilities in the future. If I know that I have someone that's very passionate about parenting and providing positive Indian parenting groups in our community, that's going to kind of guide me on what grants we're going to pursue in the future. Uh, next slide, please. So leveraging com complementary programs and systems. Um, this is a, a five-fold strategy that we've used, and it's been very successful. Um, since we're a federally recognized tribe, we're eligible for a 638 compact agreement, um, which makes it where our program is eligible to build Medicaid at the o OMB rate. Um, this has been a key piece to our sustainability as the six counselors that we have on staff right now are able to fund their own positions and then also have access to cover, you know, cost of our, uh, our location, supplies, rent, utilities, stuff like that. There's also a program in the state of Oklahoma called TNAM, and it provides a reimbursement for assisting individuals that apply or renew for their Sooner Care or their Oklahoma Medicaid. So utilizing that has been key as well. We also seek out federal funding opportunities in the way of grants. So we currently have four other grant projects that we're implementing right now with SAMHSA, OVW, NCII. Um, we also continue to pursue funding opportunities that help us meet the needs and the gaps in our community. So again, like assessing and addressing those needs is vital because if we can understand what the needs are, that helps guide which direction we're gonna go in with future grant funding. Um, we also have been successful with contract funding from nonprofits. Um, we very closely collaborate with our local domestic violence and sexual assault shelter. Um, as they have pursued grants, they have written in for counseling vouchers. And having MOUs in place um, to utilize those vouchers for our program has been key. And it's also alleviated a lot of pressure from that shelter to have to find someone that will use those vouchers for therapy. Um, and then contract funding from tribal agencies. We're in a unique area in Oklahoma where there are nine other federally recognized tribes in our county. Uh, many of these tribes have created domestic violence or youth and family departments where they've applied for grant funding or that their tribe is dedicated. Um, so if we can use those funding sources to provide treatment expenses and cover those costs for those tribes, we're going to do that. Um, and then in doing that, we're building rapport with those other agencies and departments. Uh, and then our last key um, existing program that we've been utilizing is referral sources. So having a, a strong relationship with our Boys and Girls Club, area schools, social workers and counselors, um, Indian health services, local physicians, that opens the door for referrals to come to us so we can continue to provide that healing for our community. Next slide, please. So overcoming challenges, um, again, COVID-19, dealing with policies uh, and closures has been kind of a, uh, a thorn in our side for the last couple of years. Um, internally, we didn't have a lot of direction when it came to developing those policies. Um, we're, like I said, we're only a few years old in, the, in our program. Um, 
So we've really had to kind of think on the fly and build a guide based on what the threat level was in our county at any given time. Um, we've adapted. We've provided teletherapy services. We've worked uh, on site at local schools, uh, the community crisis center, different shelters, things like that. And uh, we continue to just navigate moving forward as it's, uh, it's still a relevant threat that we need to be aware of. Another challenge has been the demand in our community for mental health treatment. So currently our program has over 200 active clients that are receiving treatment. And we really try to prioritize quality over quantity. So you can, you can come to expect that our, our counselors are not gonna experience burnout because we limit their caseloads at 25 max. Um, this allows for more consistent follow-up and frequency in their treatment. Um, and it also will uh, help initiate and build that rapport between our clients and their therapist. Unfortunately, this has kind of opened up a door for a waiting list, and we've had a waiting list for five months um, as we're kind of waiting for a room to grow. Location has been a, uh, another challenge for us is the office space that we're currently renting out is at capacity. Um, Jessica, who couldn't be on the call today, she is our, uh, our director of behavioral, behavioral health services. She actually gave up her office space so we could bring in another counselor, and we're already bursting at the seams again. So there is a huge need in our community and we wanna be able to meet that need, but we also need to understand that we can't take on everyone all at once. We have to have a steady flow, otherwise we'll experience burnout and we'll see a less quality service. Um, sustainability, so that rapid growth and trying to plan for the future and also just implementing our program while we're developing it. That is always a challenge and it will probably always be a challenge, but it's one that we're, we're ready to tackle. And then maintaining relationships is key. Um, you know, if we don't form those relationships with our stakeholders in our communities or the schools or the parents that we, that we help out, the clients that we help out, we're not doing anything. We're just kind of going through the motions. So we have to make sure that we're maintaining those relationships and we're doing everything possible on our end to make sure that healing is taking place. Next slide, please. So I just want to end on a, a quote here from Harvell Hendricks, um, to speak to those relationships that I was just talking about. It says, we are born in relationship, we are wounded in relationship, and we are healed in relationship. So just really let that kind of permeate you as you continue on with the rest of this presentation. Understand that relationship is key. Being present in those relationships is also key. Um, this is our contact information. If you have any questions, feel free to reach out to myself or Jessica. We are more than happy to talk shop with any of you. Thank you. Thank you, Jason. Our next presenter is Rebecca Lehman from the Nimipu tribe. Rebecca? Mm, talk to me, we like hello. Um, next slide, I guess. So today I'll be talking about child abuse prevention efforts on the Nez Perce Reservation. Next slide. Slide, can you hear me? Okay, well, anyways. Uh, my name is Rebecca Lehman. Inamunik Las Human Tutelakitsit is my, my Totoka name, my Indian name, uh, Thunder Roaring from Within. I'm, I'm the director of Indian Child Welfare for Nespris Tribe. I oversee child protection, uh, the children's home, Nihum Yomar, my relative sober living, which is an OVC project. The Anit Teen Shelter is also an OVC, OVC, teen, uh, OVC project. And then um, I oversee the foster care program. Um, so I'd like to just take a minute to say thank you to OVC and JBS International for this opportunity to talk about the things that are being done on the Nespers Reservation. We have a lot of good things going um, to give service to the community, to work with our youth and our families in a good way, and are pretty hopeful in our journey going forward. And today I'll briefly be talking about um, uh, the direct services that ICW offers to the reservation, um, to our youth and our families. I'll touch on our community efforts collaboratively with other tribal programs, and then I'll um, kind of end, I guess, on our on our annual communal parade that we that we hold every year that keeps just keeps growing. Uh, so next slide, diving right into our direct services. Um, this is actually 
a uh, picture of my staff. We, uh, we were making tobacco ties that day. Uh, I believe this was a, a call to action by the white bison due to the suicide um, epidemic that was going on on another reservation. It was a call to action and we responded. I think that's just an example of some of the cultural activities we do as a staff to take care of ourselves, um, to be present and to be mindful of others, you know, to share a good laugh, to, to pick on each other, you know, gently bully each other is what I, what I refer to without getting HR involved. Um, but I'll, uh, yeah, <laughs> next slide. <sighs> next slide. So I, ICW, um, what, what we know is, you know, through a child dependency case, we, all of those typical active efforts, um, for reunification, independent living for our youth above the age of 14. And then, you know, really speaking about the wraparound services, we have some amazing partnerships with our, with our, with our community partners and stakeholders, ranging from the, the IHS Behavioral Health Clinic here on the reservation, um, community health, law enforcement, the FBI for victim services. We, we have relationships with our, our grassroots and pool abiding over where um, they host kids. You know, they invite kids to come out and attend a talking circle to be present in some of their camping trips, the whitewater rafting. Um, we have a lot of, of, of people coming forward to, to be a support to the effort, to, you know, as a whole. And we also um, connect with services off reservation for children's mental health, including our partnership with equine therapy as well. And, and you know, hearing Jason talk about that, that program, it's it's so profound to watch children connect with a horse. This giant, you know, 1200, I don't know how much a horse weighs, but this giant animal that could literally like crush us is so gentle and loving and, care, and caring with a child who is experiencing trauma or anxiety. Um, those, those animals really take care of our kids. Um, and then, so along with the ordinary, I just wanted to touch briefly about uh, the honor and the privilege that it is to work with these kids with trauma to be there, to be present, to assist in some of their first, you know, their first time going to, going to a zoo, their first time, uh, we, we live in, in rural Idaho, but we have had the opportunity to take kids to the coast, the, 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 the coast in Oregon, and that, that wonder and that amazement when a child sees the ocean for the first time is, it's really, really powerful. Uh, we've also had a yes day. Um, the, our tribe released some COVID CARES money to every real tribal member, which included the children. So uh, we tasked, we had, we had staff that brought our, our kids to a, a larger community with a shopping malls and big, um, big stuff. And to have a yes day with kids and the staff directive was you can't say no. So if they want to buy something that is ridiculous, you can't say no. So many of our kids burned through, you know, quite a bit of money in about a four-hour time frame, but it was so fun and so exciting um, just to, to celebrate and to be, be happy in their joy, I guess, to celebrate their joy with them. Here listed, I have some of the curriculums that we do, do deliver to parents, um, our parenting classes. I'll note, though, too, that, through, you know, through these curriculums, um, we don't just target the families that are engaged in our program. This is open community-wide. It is shared across all of our social media platforms, including um, the tribal website, that our parenting classes are open to everyone. Our GONAs for youth are open to everyone. Uh, we want to provide opportunity for learning and growth to everyone, um, which also includes actually our Idaho, our Idaho program, the, the Idaho Department of Health and Welfare, their foster families are invited to these opportunities as well, you know, in the instance that they get a tribal placement, in the instance that they get a, a placement of a child that has um, Nesper's heritage. We want to provide opportunity to everyone. Um, some of the education that we offer the community through this program um, includes, especially in the month of April, is, is when, we, when we do a lot of community effort um, education through mandatory reporting, we do drug identification, we do healthy touch um, for our schools um, and well, community members. We do strengthening families, working with substance abuse and families through NICWA, um, working with um, sexual assault survivors and um, helping to identify and you know, do those minimal facts to, to pick, on sign, pick up on signs of, of grooming and actual abuse. This staff I have, so this is about 10 of our staff, our ICW, 10 out of 18. Um, 
this staff is young, they're energetic, and they're willing to be of service. So they do get into the school every week to do uh, a variation of the white bison. They do financial literacy, healthy relationships. They do talking circles and other cultural activities. Um, other cultural activities in classrooms that are identified by the school staff as high risk. Uh, next slide. Next slide. Okay, so uh, wait a minute. Oh, I think we went too far. It's okay. So services to youth, adults, and families. Um, our program does teen nights and education nights. Um, we do a lot of collaboration with other programs. We are a rural reservation. So we partner with a lot of our tribal programs to do um, cultural activities. And I've been seeing these at least weekly, whether it's um, moccasin making, regalia making, hand drums, um, net making, ribbon shirts, ribbon skirts. Um, a lot of culture is being, being brought back. So, um, ICW, this program is using a lot of our of our support services money through our program to to bring about culture and education and support to be with our kids, to work with kids, to build a relationship with them and build that connection to be that one healthy adult that a child needs in their life, right? Whether we're whether we're in a good place or a bad place, to have one adult that we can talk to is is very very powerful. So. The more we're in the community, the more the higher the demand. Actually, ironically, we're we're seeing, um, but we're able to come together and, and to just show up. Um, some of the pictures you see on your screen here are actually on um, that top left picture is from ICW spearheaded a, a fundraiser event for the Lapway uh, Fire Department. So we have a lighted Christmas parade on a very chilly evening, um, right before Christmas, and raised quite a bit of money for the much needed supplies and gear for our fire department. Um, we had, I think, 30 entries into our into our parade, and um, you know, the Grinch and Santa made an appearance, and it was, it was just a lot of fun. Uh, and building relationships with um, all communities on the reservation, that picture in the right corner is, um, in the Lapway and Kamiak communities, which are the two highest populated communities on the reservation, we hosted a homecoming parade competition. So um, the, each class was tasked with building a float. Um, for the class, the theme was cultures prevention. We had a lot of different submissions. Uh, we had kids singing songs, we had kids riding horses, we had kids um, dressed in regalia, um, dancing down the street. We just had a lot of amazing entries. Um, uh, from the from the kids, but also the tribal programs, and we hosted a lunch for them, just for them, um, as a prize. That bottom picture there is one of our our most recent donors. That was just in the very um, tail end, I guess, of the of the lockdown. We were able to get Marcus Red Thunder here from uh, Native Wellness Institute to host a, to help us host a donor uh, before we headed back to school. Uh, and got uh, as many youth as we could. I think we capped it at 50. Um, that center picture there is, uh, we had a fun day, we delivered curriculum, um, but I think sometimes, you know, we focus so much on, on teaching the curriculum. Uh, what's our lesson? Um, and, and, you know, there's truth in that. However, we also take the opportunity to spend even just uh, 45 minutes on curriculum and then a couple hours just having fun. Um, just uh, whether we're playing, I don't know what it's called in other reservations, but you know, sweep the teepee and um, horse and rider and, and um, different fun games, stick games uh, with our kids, just to to have that relationship. Next slide. And here's some more pictures of. Um, I think I talk about our Wallala our Wallala retreat in, in a later slide, but that that um, these. The top picture and the picture on the right is we are actually in our in our Wallawa homelands in Oregon um, at the Tam Kalik Longhouse. We brought children over there um, to camp. We literally camped for two days in the in the very cold, very cold. Uh, we went too early that year, uh, but we slept in teepees. We learned how to put teepees up. Um, a drum came with us, so kids were taught the owl dance and the rabbit dance and the happy dance and the snake dance and and um, there we were playing stick games as well there on the right. 
in those two smaller pictures, I just wanted to give a, a further example of how bringing kids out into the mountains to also perform cultural activities. This is this is root digging. That, that little picture on the left is um, actually me and my daughter. We were out digging um, camas that day. And the other one, I think we were just digging the keep, which are traditional roots and medicines on our reservation that we utilize. Um, next slide. <coughs> so finally, our child abuse prevention efforts. This year, 2022, was our sixth annual pinwheel parade. Um, this started out as very small, uh, where we, we only had the, the elementary school kids involved, where we gave them, um, they made their own posters, we gave them each a pinwheel, and we, we walked around the, it's a small little, we call it the parade grounds or the BIA grounds, um, but the kids were able to get out and just run and chase and laugh and, and um, be present. It kind of grew into, we were actually featured on the local news, where it grew into um, both all of the schools, so we had an elementary school and we have the high school, um, come together and do an actual pinwheel parade through town with police escort, where we, we leave the schools and we go down to the local city park and we join the drum. Uh, the drum will, will play, you know, obviously drum songs for us and we have speakers from our, our tribal council, say good words, um, different programs would, would be present and that just continued to grow into um, the last two years have been full-fledged family engagement days with activities, program booths, coloring booths, um, those fun little fishing booths. Um, the library was set up. We had cake walks or cupcake walks. Um, and then this year, we also had um, Easter egg. Well, last, last year and this year, we had Easter egg hunts. So we're finding ways to have fun with our community, um, to be present in our community, and to also spread information and education about the need to come together as a community to prevent child abuse. Um, our focus right now is morphing into, you know, response to the opioid uh, epidemic, um, but we, we are finding fun ways to, to spread awareness. And um, next slide. And get everyone, get everyone involved. So, um, our, our children are generally escorted by our Nez Perce Tribal Police, um, our county police, our state police, our Quad City Task Force. We get absolutely every law enforcement agency that we can in our area to become um, involved in this. Because I think so much, so many times kids with trauma are afraid of police, right? They, they have this, this idea in their head that we can't talk to cops, we can't be nice to cops. And you know that, that a lot of that is learned behavior. But we also take the opportunity to um, shed a positive light on our law enforcement, that they are here to help us, they are here to be present. Um, there, that, that center picture on the bottom is um, our law enforcement actually, they cook, our, they cook our burgers and our dogs for our family engagement day. And they, and we had, we had our, our assigned FBI agents for serving meals. So I know that Rebecca can be a little pushy and a little, a little, Hey, I need you to do this for me, uh, but they respond, they show up, and it, it, we've had a lot of positive feedback from having our law enforcement present. Um, kids get to, to meet and greet with the cops, so to speak, while also um, having a neutral setting to build a, a, like a positive relationship rather than a, a traumatic one. Um, that tiny little picture there on the, in the center on the right is um, from last Friday. Actually, where we, um, all of the kids from the schools, we had a, we had two friendship dances, we had a happy dance, a circle dance. Um, so it's growing, and these these activities, uh, these cultural activities, are starting um, as as young as kindergarten. And you know, some of our seniors that are graduating this year can remember back to when we started this this project, this pinwheel parade project, when they were in the I believe in the, they said that sixth grade. So, well, I don't know, I could be completely wrong, but really when they were in elementary school. Next slide. <laughs> Next slide. So, um, Mamayats are the future, children are the future, and Mamayats, uh, that is our traditional and first language for child. Um, this has really been our focus through the various different projects that we have going um, with within the community. We're grateful for the support of the community. We're, we're grateful for tri 
for her tribal leadership, um, supporting what we're doing. Um, where OVC has also been incredibly supportive of these, these visions that we've had for our sober living home for women and children, for our teen shelter that is about ready to get up and going. Um, and we're grateful. We are grateful to be able to be a part of the change, to, to break this cycle and to bring um, cultural activities into the community um, where our children, they've heard us. Um, you know, uh, last weekend we had a very unfortunate event um, where we lost we lost some um, some of our youth in a in a tragic car accident. And the week you know the week of services to see our children come together and to um, spend days making that you know there were two consecutive days where our our high school was shut down. <clears throat> Excuse me. Our high school was shut down so that our youth could make uh, ribbon skirts and ribbon shirts and wing dresses to at attend traditional services for their classmates. Uh, they hear us, you know, as adults in the, we have the ability to promote change, to um, increase our prevention, to, to lead in a good way because our, our children are watching. Our children are watching and they are, they are ready to teach us too. Uh, and I think that's our vision going forward, you know, to continue these projects, but also, oh, I didn't expect to get emotional, I apologize. Um, to sit down with our youth and, you know, what more can we do for you? How much, or how much can we, uh, I, don't, I don't want to be challenged, I just, how much, what more can we do? And to really listen to our youth and to really be open to their responses, um, I think is, is powerful in our prevention efforts. So I, I feel like I just lost myself because I walked out a little emotional. So next slide. <laughs> I think that's, um, yeah, so thank you. Thank you. I, I didn't mean to derail. I apologize. Um, but this is my contact information, my email, and my, um, my contact number. So thank you. Thank, thank you, Rebecca. Uh, just so you know, we're all human beings and human beings emote as humans. Um, and I just uh, want to say I honor and acknowledge the grief that is in our respective Native communities, because uh, at least a couple of our people have been, um, have had grief in their communities. So I acknowledge that. Okay, our next on our um, in our lineup is uh, Gloria D from the Capacity Builders and from the Dene Nation. Gloria, go ahead. Thank you. Um, yat e she yaha Gloria D shita jenedo hawan salen shlo thorich ini bashish chin alot ashche e dashche ado but ani e dashnala hot out san shle. I just said my four clans of who I am. I am of the many Hogan's maternal clan. Paternal is bitter water. And my paternal grandfather is the red streaks on his cheeks. And then um, my maternal is the under his sheaves folded arms clan. So today I just wanted to, um, um, my next slide just to say who we are, what we do. Um, Capacity Builders is a 501 nonprofit organization. We are located in the Four Corners area where it brings, um, we could be in Colorado in 40 minutes, um, Arizona in 30 minutes, and in Utah in about the same time, maybe 40 minutes. So we, um, at the Four Corners area, and so we, our company does secure federal, state, and local grant funding for us to meet um, the needs and to fill in the gaps of services in our tribal, tribal communities and underserved communities. Uh, next slide, please. Um, recently, we've um, got Desert View family counseling and we like to honor our partnership be it, they are the people who provide services to the children that get referred from the schools or um, 
you know, from the um, police department. So this is some of the services that they provide. And also that our company does have um, master social workers on board where we do a lot of peer mentoring. And part of our peer mentoring is on a cultural um, sensitivity where I myself am a peer mentor and I um, find it to be very important to do our clanship system and um, of identifying who we are. So a lot of the children really love that and telling them where that clan came from. We share a story. We talk about our Navajo philosophy, values, and teachings. And we always are taught that we are the five-fingered people, the earth surface people, and spiritual beings whose purpose is to seek and establish and advocate harmony and that's how we walk in beauty and that's why we have all these ceremonies to keep us balanced on earth and so we talk about our Navajo values versus societal uh, blessing way teachings and protection way teachings all the do's and don'ts that are taboo in our culture uh, next slide please um, we also established tribal police partnership even as we speak today, the Navajo police are in the building here with us and they are having a meeting. So we were able to establish um, partnership with our tribal police, the Navajo police um, in San Juan County area where we they um, attained um, cross commission with the New Mexico State Police. So we're beginning to see that picture open where we're able to work together on you know, circumstances where we have youth who are in trouble to where um, those that are needing services. Next slide, please. Oh, you will notice that the reservation is as big as uh, West, the state of West Virginia, um, 27,000 square miles. Um, we always mention sustainability in the work we do at Capacity Builders. Majority of all of our staff here are certified mental um, mental health first aiders. Um, we are state um, certified Medicaid pre, pre uh, oh my gosh I'm getting tend to say predeterminers which we enroll youth in their families. Say like some families come in and um, they don't have any means of um, paying for their child's um, treatment. So we will go in and we will go into the state portal and we'll enroll them and to see if they qualify for Medicaid services. We also have our certified teen outreach program facilitators. Everybody that comes join our team become, um, you know, we, we um, they become certified in these programs to carry on our learn our long term um, needed services and part of our sustainability is to identify the resources that are needed over the long term. Um, we identify appropriate partners and sources who we could carry forward. Uh, next slide, please. Community service learning. We've done a lot of outreach services. Um, you'll see that in the photo, we even invited our current Navajo Nation um, president, Jonathan Nez who is leading our people and he came to our back to school drive through and we were giving away tie dye shirts if children answered all four of their clans. So we did that as an outreach um, back to school. And then we have um, children who are in the uh, teen outreach program um, participate in class and the thing that I really love about this is that they, they can introduce themselves. Um, they say that we are a dying language, but I don't think so. I still have hope that we're holding on to that. I'm very, um, I'm bilingual. And um, and then at the bottom photo shows that um, our Nav we have a Navajo Youth Builders Coalition. And so out of that coalition, we were able to establish a Navajo Youth Builders work crew who um, built a basketball court, a, um, a skate park for our youth in the community of Shiprock. And it was very beautiful. And, and unfortunately, you know, during that time of um, um, one of our crew members had, um, had died and we planted a tree in his memory at that park and it's going really be growing beautiful. And the picture there is um, sitting right where the Navajo Nation president sits, that's Window Rock. Um, 
very beautiful place to be. Um, you know, next slide, please. And this year, we decided that we would um, participate in our Sexual Assault Awareness Month. And so staff took the initiative to tie their hair in a hair bun. It's called a tziyeh. And so um, our hair was um, tied. And when you see women with their hair tied, that said that that's our protection, you know, as we walk, you know, on, on the earth. Um, you know, we're like lady warriors, you know, that's our strength there, you know, to keep our thoughts, our mind clear, and that we are able to think, you know, a far ahead, ahead, you know, in, in our future. So I got staff together and we had our, we made the hair ties and we tied everybody's hair to acknowledge the Sexual Assault Awareness Month. And so, and then I also have a prevention outreach team. And we were messing around with our camera and we decided that we take this picture and um, this is my outreach team that go out and do a lot of outreach events out on the Navajo reservation. Thank you, um, next slide please. Here is our um, executive director, Mrs. Um, Kimel Cardin. There's me as a project director and our progress director who is Corrine Flores, um, next slide. Um, thank you. And behind this photo is a volcanic rock and his name, Rock with Wings. They, in Navajo, it's called Tsebeta. And it sits in Shiprock, New Mexico. We're about 30 minutes away. And everybody likes to use Shiprock on their logos because this is a very sacred place. And it's very, um, they call it a rock with wings. Um, there's a lot of stories behind it. And there's, you know, um, they say that there was an eagle that was underground and that was the tip of his his wings so that's how they named shiprock and it became volcanic very beautiful place um, next slide um, here is um, our address uh, contact number and our email and part of our mentoring uh, we still practice our kenelda which is a puberty ceremony for young women and so uh, during the ceremony, um, my little granddaughter there, she had to learn how to prepare meals. Um, we start them up early and how to start making fry bread, um, you know, peeling potatoes, teaching them, you know, to use the cooking tools, weaving tools. And the other photo shows that um, her, a mentor is appointed and the mentoring is you know, taking place during a puberty ceremony, talking to her, telling her, um, you know, what is she's what she's going to be doing within the next four days of ceremony, and this is a time when um, it's really sacred for her because her body is changing within that time. They do an all night singing. Um, the medicine man would come in at midnight and perform beautiful way songs for her. We sing about the horses, all the elements in the universe. We sing about how to have a home, you know, the home spirit, you know, how you keep up a home, um, different, all the elements you can imagine, everything that's living life is those beautiful songs. And it, these songs are embedded with like on a journey to all of the mountains and what these people had saw through the mountains to the blue birds to the yellow birds all different um animals and they all had a sacred song to them and when you sit there boy those songs you get very emotional and you just want to cry and so and those songs are so beautiful and precious and i'm so happy to say that we still have these ceremonies and this took place in january when it was cold here but we survived and so um thank you okay oh miigwech gloria some awesome stories i really um touched my heart so thank mm -hmm. you mm -hmm. our next presenter is elizabeth adams oh before we i introduce her uh just a quick um quick update. We're going to be running over on the time. So for those of you who are unable to stay, uh, thank you for coming. And uh, 
there there will be a recording available after the event and and I think we're posting it on our United for Youth website as well. So um, our next speaker is Elizabeth Adams from the Native American Community Clinic out of Minneapolis, Minnesota. Elizabeth. Hi, I'm Elizabeth Adams. Um, I work at the Native American Community Clinic in Minneapolis as the OVC coordinator. Um, next slide, please. So just a little bit about us quick. Um, the Native American Community Clinic opened its doors in 2003 to address the health disparities within the urban Native American community of Twin Cities. We offer a full range of healthcare services that include medical, behavioral, dental, and substance abuse programs. NAC approaches healthcare by addressing root causes of health disparities, including access to food, housing, and health insurance with services such as resource navigation, care coordination, outreach, and community-based activities through the use of our peer recovery coaches and community health workers. NAC strives to honor health and tradition by providing spiritual and access, spiritual care and access to, to traditional healing through our elders and residents. Next slide, please. So NAC's mission is to promote health and wellness of mind, body, and spirit in the Native American families. We value health and tradition, provide high quality care regardless of the ability to pay, and aim to increase health, health equity for Native American families in the Twin Cities. Everyone is welcome at NAC clinics and we strive to be a good relative to all. Next slide, please. So our grant focused on enhancing community responses to the opiate crisis, serving our youngest victims of crime. This project takes place within the urban American Indian community in Minneapolis, Minnesota. Among this population, the primary focus of the project is American Indian children and youth that have been victims of crime due to the opiate crisis. The overall project strategy is to provide direct services and advocate for these children and young victims at a community level. Next slide, please. Our primary service setting is at the NAC Behavioral Health Clinic and we partner with local schools and residential areas like Little Earth. We also provide services such as small groups and individual therapy in the school setting. Our project goals are to create pathways for youth to gain more access to mental and spiritual health care and provide those services in a variety of settings where youth are more likely to access those services. Um, so some of the core and primary activities we do are um, group therapy or um, just groups for kids to come and participate in, individual therapy, crisis management, and trauma-informed care presentations to schools and primary care staff as well. Um, we have implemented groups in two schools and are providing services to students and youth we would not have been able to reach prior to this grant. We are in the process of partnering with the police department and the schools to pilot a handle with care program to better enable schools to respond to youth exposed to traumatic events when police are involved. We also provide trauma informed training to schools to assist in the goals established by our districts to establish trauma informed schools. Next slide, please. Um, NAC's focus on culture translates to including an elder in residence to every team involved in therapeutic presentations, interventions, cultural events, and workshops. Elders and residents are available daily and program participants in school meet in a group weekly. This culture and value system influences how services are provided by placing an emphasis on overall well being and addressing the whole person. While there is an emphasis on the individual, there is also a focus on the family and community through programming and cultural events. So the data we collect is analyzed through qualitative and quantitative measures. We have a data management employee who assists with data documentation, analysis, and interpretation, as well as the team at John Hopkins Research Center that assists us with special projects such as our community needs assessment. Next slide, please. Um, so through this, we discovered the importance of partnerships. And so our goal was to meet youth where they were at and 
So we focused our attention on local schools with a high need of population in the Little Earth residency. By building these relationships with their employees and the students and kids, NAC was able to create successful partnerships and collaborations within the community. While we did experience challenges such as the COVID-19 shutdowns and school closures during teacher strikes, we were able to overcome some of these difficulties, some difficulties these challenges presented by offering online therapy and cultural care. We engage with and collaborate with our partners through tabling to disseminate information from big events and kids groups. These activities help build the relationships in the community that allow families to feel more comfortable connecting with us and sharing their struggles so we may be able to better help them. These activities also inform some of the resources available to them and where they may seek help. Next slide, please. NAC staff has participated in trauma-informed trainings in collaboration with therapists to build and provide trauma-informed programs. When an ind individual begins services, they work with the therapist to complete a diagnostic assessment. Within this assessment, there is a survey that identifies primary, secondary, generational, and multi-generational trauma so that we are able to best provide services to the individual and family systems. Within NAC, we support and promote self-care among our program staff by encouraging participation in cultural events, creating space for self-care at NAC, and through on-site yoga and exercise classes. We also collaborate with our community partners in cultural and healing events, such as talking circles, smudging, and healing ceremonies for self-care and renewal. Next slide, please. We were able to utilize existing programs we work with at local schools and universities, such as clinical internships, trainings, event planning for conferences and leadership camps to support school interventions and programs, as well as services in the various clinics in the organization. Cultural services, housing services, social support services, and harm reduction services provide support to our families who are struggling with OUD and assist in supporting families as they develop into their recovery healing journey. A grantee who does not have these systems in place could begin reaching out to schools and sister programs to create relationships to utilize their infrastructure to increase supportive services with community awareness on harm reduction and culture. Next slide, please. Thank you. Nope. Okay, is that it? Is that the last slide? Yeah, it okay. is. Perfect, thanks. Okay, thank you, Elizabeth. Well, uh, is there any questions in, or answer, any questions? <laughs> My bad. Um, Don't see any questions in the chat right now, surely, so. Um, okay, so this is the end of our, uh, Presentations and thank you, Miigwech, uh, to Gloria, Gretchen, Jason. Uh, Jessica wasn't here, but I know she contributed to the PowerPoint. Uh, Rebecca and usually Rebecca has Jasmine High Eagle with her, and Jasmine went and did some traditional things uh, with her people. And thank you, Jasmine, for all the work you do in your community. Uh, you do some awesome stuff and. All of them do awesome work. And thank you again, Miigwech, Chi Miigwech to all of them. They're, um, to me, they're all healing warriors in our communities and Miigwech to those healing warriors for all your beautiful work that you're, you've been doing. So if it's okay, I'll close with a, with a song. It's the water song. Um, so please, yes, please do the, uh, the webinar surveys. If there's anything we can do for future one of webinars, if you would like to see anything in the future, and if we can do anything differently, let us know. We're happy to help and to provide any kind of training or um, information that is needed in the community. So this song I'm gonna sing, it's a, just, I'm just gonna sing a couple of the verses. It's, the, it's called the water song. It says, water, we thank you, we love you, we respect you. Nibe gizagegu 
Gimme gwecho we ni mi gu. Gija we ni mi gu. Ni be giza ge gu. Gimme gwecho we ni mi gu. Gija we ni mi gu. Ni be giza ge gu. Gimme gwecho we ni mi gu. Gija we ni mi gu. Ni be giza ge gu. Gimme gwecho we ni mi gu. Gija we ni mi gu. Oh, mi gwecho. Nagach. Ikuapamin nagach. Later.